in our paper, we combine four different models from several disciplines to get at the effect of climate change. So we take a multi-stage approach to modeling rice production, and in general, there are several reasons why a single-stage production function is ill-suited for modeling crop cultivation. Inputs into crop cultivation are characterized not only by their physical qualities, but also by the timing of the application. Farmers' input decisions later in crop cultivation process are made in response to production shocks realized early in the process. So this gives rise to indigeneity. Production shocks realized earlier in the cultivation process update farmers' information set and so update his expectations of future production shocks later in the stage. So we identify three stages, three growth phases, which are roughly uh, planting, plant growth, and harvesting. For each of these three production stages, we can think of them as a separate production sub-process with its own production function. And the inputs into that product, stage-specific production function are uh, in, like labor, non-labor inputs used in that stage, production shocks that will be realized during that stage, and also intermediate output from the previous stage, which measures the progress of rice growth. And then if we substitute in recursively for the intermediate output levels, we'll get a composite production function, which describes final yield as a function of inputs and shocks throughout the all three production stages and initial conditions. If we look at the first order condition for intermediate input, in this case it's intermediate labor, we see that it's marginal cost and so it's marginal product has two components. One is the current component, which is just current price of the input, and another is the future component, which reflects changes or farmers' adjustments of input levels in future stages in response to the changes in crop growth development due to changes in levels of current inputs used. And we estimate our model as a system of simultaneous equations, which includes composite production function, which is again yield as a function of all inputs throughout all stages. And our system also includes uh, equations for input decision rules at each stage. And in our estimation, we use stage and operation specific input prices as instruments. And we also use farmer specific uh, rainfall expectations. And we use an uh, unbalanced five year panel uh, for 137 households. To do the estimation, we need some measure of the intermediate output. We also use something called a crop model to estimate uh, crop yields. And we also use a weather, stochastic weather generator. And we condition those on <laughs> predicted climate changes from some uh, global climate models and some different economic scenarios. The response of the crop to fertilizer or rain or temperature is not linear, and there are uh, models that are developed in soil science that are calibrated in laboratory conditions that describe how the crop grows um, step by step. We, there are different crop models that we could choose. We decided to go with one called DSET, um, and what it's literally modeling is the growth of a single plant um, across the whole calendar year. It has a, uh, literally a couple dozen inputs that can be inputted for soil and weather. This is a listing of some of them, so it's very precise, um, and it has a series of models that are nested. So the advantages of this, as I mentioned, are we can capture the crop response due to the climatic and soil conditions. That gives us this lens to capture that. And um, we do are able to model some of the main farmer inputs, fertilizer, planting day, and we can capture these nonlinear crop growth responses that are inherent in the DSAT model. So now we wanted to look at the impact of climate models, and <clears throat> we wanted to get predictions from climate models. I didn't know much about this field before I started this paper, 
But there are these uh, coupled atmospheric oceanic general circulation models, which are sort of the state-of-the-art climate modeling. A key next step is to consider what are going to be the changes in emissions due to human-induced or anthropogenic changes. So we have the, the climate models, but then we also have what are the predicted changes in emissions due to human activity. And for that, the IPCC has created a, a set of scenarios that they group into about six different families, ranging from high emissions to low emissions. And we chose uh, the highest emissions one and the lowest emissions. So we were able to look at the, both of the predicted extremes. Um, so now we needed a way to simulate future weather based on these economic scenarios and global climate models. <laughs> Uh, this is something called the, the WGEN Stochastic Weather Generator. Um, it uses Markov chain gamma distribution model. It, what it first does is it looks at the historical data, and we're able to use this weather generator to generate stochastic simulations. So the way the model works is it first takes the 30 years of historical data, and it creates a, a large table of summary statistics describing both the monthly mean amounts and also uh, intercorrelations between variables, the probability of dry days, the probability of wet days, um, and then it uses that to generate stochastic weather. With these climate change modifications, we're getting predictions of likely future weather conditioned on the existing trends and patterns in the historical data, but modified slightly for the climate change signal. And using that, we then go back to DSEG and we simulate yields, and we we had 100 realizations for each scenario, so we produced 100 realizations uh, for each plot. And the weather generator does a, a random draw to generate these different stochastic realizations. So we get a distribution for each plot. But just comparing here model productions to DSAT, we see that even taking the small, well, just one way farmers can adjust changes in input levels makes a big effect on rice yields. And we can also see that farmers are able to actually benefit from a milder climate change and to somewhat, to some extent, go to neutralizing the adverse effect of a more extreme climate change. So what we see is that for this ad, neither the household income level nor the soil quality really affect changes in rice yields under either high or low emission scenario. And this table does the same comparison for model predictions. And we see the same thing, that soil quality is not significant at all in whether farmers yields go up or down. And farmers income doesn't really matter too, with one exception, that under low uh, emissions climate change scenario, plots that do experience decrease in rice yields are more likely to belong to kind of poorer households. So remember that the, according to the model predictions and the low emission scenario, most farmers actually benefited slightly and had experienced a slight increase in yields, and a small group experienced a complete crop failure. So this results tells us that the small group that didn't manage to benefit in circumstances when everyone else was kind of well off, they're likely to be wrong. Uh, we think our results are interesting because they show how much taking into account farmers' adjustment affects predictions of economic and welfare effects of climate change, and also they kind of underline how just considering two different climate scenarios, high and low, can yield very different results. 